Chapter 17 4,000 Leagues Under the Pacific The next morning was the 18th of November, and I had quite recovered my fatigues of the day before, and I went up on the platform, just as the second lieutenant was uttering his daily phrase. I was admiring the magnificent aspect of the ocean when Captain Nemo appeared. He did not seem to be aware of my presence and began a series of astronomical observations. Then, when he had finished, he went and leant on the cage of the watchlight and gazed abstractly down the ocean. In the meantime, a number of the sails of sailors of the Nautilus, all strong and healthy men, had come up onto the platform. They came to draw up the nets that had been laid out all night. These sailors were evidently of different nations, although the European type was visible in all of them. I recognized some unmistakable Irishmen, Frenchmen, some sclaves, and a Greek or a candiote. They were civil and only used that odd language among themselves, the origin of which I could not guess, and neither could I question them. The nets were hauled in. There was a large kind of shallots, like those of the Normandy coast, great pockets that the waves and a chain fixed to the smaller meshes kept open. These pockets, drawn by iron poles, swept through the water and gathered in everything in their way. That day they brought up curious specimens from those productive coasts, fishing frogs that from their comical movements had acquired the name of buffoons. Black commersions furnished with antennae, trigger fish encircled with red bands, orthrogoroskis with very subtle venom, some olive-colored lampreys, macrophrinci colored with silvery scales, trichieri, the electric power of which is equal to that of the gynotus and crampfish, Scaly notopetri and transverse brown bands, greenish cod, several varieties of gobies, etc. Also some larger fish, a caranax with a prominent head a yard long, several fine bonitos streaked with blue and silver, and three splendid coonies, which spite of the sp in spite of the swiftness of their motion had not escaped the net. I reckon that the hall had brought in more than 900 weight of fish, it was a fine haul, but not to be wondered at. Indeed, the nets ha are let down for several hours and enclose in their meshes an infinite variety. We had no lack of excellent food, and the rapidity of the Nautilus and the attraction of the electric light could always renew our supply. These several productions of the sea were immediately lowered through the panel to the steward's room, some to be eaten fresh and others pickled. The fishing ended and the provision of air renewed. I thought the Nautilus was about to continue its submarine excursion and was preparing to return to my room, when, without further preamble, the captain turned to me, saying, Professor, is not this ocean gifted with real life? It has its tempers and its gentle moods. Yesterday it slept as we did, and now it has woke after a quiet night. Look, he continued, it wakes under the caresses of the sun. It is going to renew its diurnal existence. It is an interesting study to watch the play of its organization. It has a pulse, arteries, spasms, and I agree with the learned Mallory, who discovered in it a circulation as real as the circulation of blood in animals. Yes, the ocean has indeed circulation, and to promote it, the Creator has caused things to multiply in it. Caloric, salts, and animal, animal curule. When Captain Nemo spoke thus, he seemed altogether changed and aroused an extraordinary no emotion in me. Also, he added, True existence is here, and I can imagine the foundations of nautical towns, clusters of submarine houses, much like the Nautilus, would ascend every morning to breathe at the surface of the water. Free towns, independent cities. Yet who knows whether some despot Captain Nemo finished his sentence with a violent gesture, then addressing me as if to chase away some sorrowful thought. Mr. Arano, he asked, do you know the depth of the ocean? I only know, Captain, that the principal soundings have taught us. Could you tell me so that I can suit them to my purpose? Well, there are some, I replied, that I remember. If I'm not mistaken, a depth of 8,000 yards has been found in the North Atlantic and 2,500 yards in the Mediterranean. The most remarkable soundings have been made in the South Atlantic near the 35th parallel, and they gave 12,000 yards, 14,000 yards, and 15,000 yards. To sum it all, it is reckoned that if the bottom of the sea were leveled, its mean depth would be about one and three quarter leagues. Well, Professor replied the captain, we shall show you better than that, I hope. 
As to the mean depth of this part of the Pacific, I tell you, it is only 4,000 yards. Having said this, Captain Nemo went towards the panel and disappeared down the ladder, followed him and went into the large drawing room. The screw was immediately put in motion, and the law gave 20 miles an hour. During the days and weeks that passed, Captain Nemo was very sparing of his visits, and I seldom saw him. The lieutenant pricked the ship's course regularly on the chart, as I could always tell exactly the route of the Nautilus. Nearly every day for some time, the panels of the drawing room were opened, and we were never tired of penetrating the mysteries of the submarine world. The general direction of the Nautilus was southeast, and it kept between 100 and 150 yards of depth. One day, however, I do not know why. Being drawn diagonally by means of the inclined planes, it touched the bed of the sea. The thermometer indicated a temperature of four and a quarter cent, a temperature that at this step seemed common to all latitudes. At three o'clock in the morning on the 26th of November, the Nautilus crossed the Tropic of Cancer at 172 degrees longitude. On the 27th instant, it, it sighted the Sandwich Islands where Cook died, February 14, 1779. We had then gone 4,860 leagues from our starting point. In the morning, when I went on the platform, I saw two miles to the windward Hawaii, the largest of the seven islands that formed the group. I saw clearly the cultivated ranges and the several mountain chains that sun parallel with the side and the volcanoes that overtop Mount Ray, which rise 5,000 yards above the level of the sea. Besides other things the nets brought up were several flabberi and graceful polypi that are particular to that part of the ocean. The direction of the Nautilus was still to the southeast. It crossed the equator on December 1st in 140 degrees longitude and on the 4th of the same month, after crossing rapidly and without another particular occurring, we sighted the Marquis Group. I saw three miles off at 8 degrees 57 minutes latitude south and 139 degrees and 32 minutes west longitude Martin's Peak and Noka Haiva the largest of the group that belongs to France. I only saw the woody mountains against the horizon because Captain Nemo did not wish to bring this ship to the wind. There the nets brought up beautiful specimens of fish, chlorophenes with azure fins and tails like gold, the fish of which is unrivaled, hollow gynoises, nearly destitute of scales but of exquisite flavor, or storines with bony jaws and yellow-tinged thassards, as good as bonitos, all fish that would be of net of use to us. After leaving, leaving these charming islands protected by the French flag, from the 4th to the 11th of December, the Nautilus sailed over about 2,000 miles. This navigation was remarkable for the meeting with an immense shoal of calmars, near neighbors to the Cuttle. The French fishermen call them hornets. They belong to the cephalod, cephalopod class and to the di brachial family that comprehends the cuddles and the argonauts. These animals were particularly studied by the students of antiquity, and they furnished numerous metaphors to the popular orators, as well as excellent dishes for the tables of the rich citizens. If one can believe Athenius, a Greek doctor who lived before Galen, it was during the night of the 9th or 10th of December that the Nautilus came across the shoal of mollusks that are particularly nocturnal. One could count them by millions. They immigrate from the temperate to the warmer zones following the track of the herrings and the sardines. We watch them through the thick crystal pane swimming down the wind with great rapidity moving by means of their own locomotive tube, pursuing fish and mollusks, eating the little ones, eaten by the big ones, and tossing about in indescribable confusion. The ten arms that nature has placed on their heads like a crest of pneumatic serpents. The Nautilus, in spite of its speed, sailed for several hours in the midst of these animals, and its nets brought in an enormous quantity, among which I recognize the nine species that D'Orbany classed of the Pacific. One saw while crossing that the sea displays the most wonderful sights. They were an endless variety. The scene changed continually, and we were called upon not only to contemplate the works of the Creator in the midst of the liquid element, but to penetrate the awful mysteries of the ocean. During the daytime of the 11th of December, I was busy reading the large drawing room, 
Ned Land and Council watched the luminous water through the half-open panels. The Nautilus was immovable. While its reservoirs were filled, it kept at a depth of 1,000 yards, a region rarely visited in the ocean and in which large fish were seldom seen. I was then reading a charming book by Jean-Marie, The Slav, The Slaves of the Stomach, and I was learning some valuable lessons from it when Council interrupted me. Well, Master, come here for a moment, he said in a curious voice. What's the matter, Council? I want Master to look. I rose, went, and leaned on my elbows before the panes and watched. In a full electric light, an enormous black mass, quite immovable, was suspended in the midst of the waters. I watched it attentively, seeking to find out the nature of this gigantic cessation. But a sudden thought crossed my mind. A vessel? I said half, half aloud. Yes, replied the Canadian, a disabled ship that has been sunk perpendicularly. Ned Land was right. We were close to a vessel of which the tattered shrouds still hung from their chains. The keel seemed to be in good order and it had been wrecked at most some few hours. Three stumps of mast broken off about two feet above the bridge showed that the vessel had had to surface it, its masts, but lying on its side it had filled and was heeling over to port. This skeleton of what it had once been was a sad spectacle as it lay lost under the waves. But sadder still was the side of the bridge where some corpses bound with ropes were still lying. I counted five, four men, one of whom was standing at the helm and a woman standing by the poop holding an infant in her arms. She was quite young. I could distinguish her features, which the water had not decomposed, by the brilliant light from the Nautilus. In one despairing effort she had raised her infant above her head. Poor little thing whose arms encircled its mother's neck. The attitude of the four sailors was frightful, distorted, as they were by their convulsive movements while making a last effort to free themselves from the cords that bound them to the vessel. The steersman alone, calm with a grave, clear face, his gray hair glued to his forehead and his hand clutching the wheel of the helm, seemed even then to be guiding the three broken masts through the depths of the ocean. What a scene. We were numb. Our hearts beat fast before this shipwreck, taken as it were from life and photographed in its last moments. And I saw already coming towards it with hungry eyes, enormous sharks attracted by the human flesh. However, the Nautilus turning went round the submerged vessel, and in one instant I read on the stern, The Florida Sunderland. <laughs>